Welcome to the Make It Happen with Will Polston podcast. These podcast episodes with Will and his guests provide you with insights on how you can transform your excuses into results to benefit yourself, your family, your friends, your community, society, humanity, and the universe with what Will calls the ripple effect. Will's mission is to empower 1 billion people via the ripple effect and intends that you'll become another person to add to the count, having listened to this episode. So Lisa, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me here. So you have got quite the uh, the, the CV, let's say, you know, in, in, in terms of um, what, what you've achieved, what we've just heard, some of the things that you've, you've done. Um, it, it's impressive by any stretch of, of what anyone's done. But what I particularly like about it is the, uh, particularly like about you, is that the, the spectrum of which you've worked on. You know, so um, from from going from one end of a spectrum right to the other end of the spectrum from um, in, in your career being very, very science focused. I mean, you've got a Ph.D. In, in engineering right through to them being a spiritual teacher, mentor um, and, and focus on that. So real two ends of the spectrum. And then in terms of your your own life as well, um, of 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 really um going through a, a very challenging time in your your early years so then coming out and and uh i'm gonna say smelling of roses but i mean it's it's, it's one of those things where it could have very much gone down a, a very very dark path so um but before we go into the the story of that what i would love to know is what's your daily thought process you know what what is it when you wake up in the morning what is it that's going through your mind ah oh, that's well okay so when i wake up in the morning I normally wake up thinking about what am I going to achieve and what joy am I going to create for myself, myself and other people, for, for other people in my life. So what, are we, what joy are we going to create for ourselves, whether it's my family, whether it's my team, whether it's my clients, my students, it's like, how can we have more fun? What a question to start the day with. How can we have more joy today? How can we have more fun? I mean, talk, talk about set your, your intention for the day. What a, what a fantastic way to do that. So. Um, I, I imagine the, that's partly born because once upon a time, there was maybe days when you woke up and that wasn't so much the case. And you've got quite a, uh, a, a powerful public, um, it's very publicly known story. You've literally wrote, written the book on it um, called I, I Love the Pedophile. That was your book. Um, so if we can take the, the listener back to Lisa, age 12. Sure. Yeah. So when I um, when I was 12, I was a normal. I, I wouldn't I mean, like what's normal anyway, but I was averagely normal. You know, I grew up in Australia, which is why you might hear that my little Australian twang. Uh, my mum was a school teacher. My dad was an entrepreneur and kind of normally happy. And uh, then I met my music teacher and uh I mean, it, sort of to be, you know, to kind of give it the the, the short version of events was um, there was so there was I started to have private guitar lessons with him, and then there was this one day when he just handed me his phone number, and I thought I don't know why he's doing that, but he said call me, and then we started having um, long long phone calls in the evening, and he kind of basically kind of seduced me into his life. And then I was 13 by the time, uh, 13 when he first attempted penetrative sex with me, 14 when he succeeded. I was 15 when he persuaded my parents to let me move in with him in, and move to England from Australia to live with him. And I ended up being pretty much a, a house prisoner for uh, just, it was just short of five years. So I moved in two weeks after my 15th birthday, and I moved out two weeks before my 20th birthday. So just shy of five years. So, so just, just to make, so this is, this is, is, and it's why we want to drill down into this. This is something your parents were aware that there was some sort of relationship going on at, um, uh, so you were in, in this relationship, with this guy, and you were, you were sort of 14, 15. Um, what, what were they thinking? I mean, this is a really common question and um, excuse me, <clears throat> it's a really common question. And one of the, cause often people, they just, you know, like, how can you understand why would your parents do that? So I think the really important thing to understand is, 
and this is not uncommon in these kind of scenarios, that a paedophile will is frequently a friend of the family, a trusted member of the family, and they seduce not only the the child but also the parents. Mm. So he was like a great friend of the family. He would come down around for family meals. He would sort of advise mum and and you know he was a friend of the family. He was a friend of my mum. Was a friend of my dad, and so they trusted him. Then what happened was he like we were really like he'd done lots and lots of um, like I was really ensconced in. Uh, a whole set of complex belief systems with that he kind of in, sort of implanted and you know all about beliefs and how they kind of pepper in and it's like they're not even conscious anymore but I had got to believe got to the state where my belief was that I was the only person who could make him happy and that was my job I had to do what he wanted me to do so that he would be happy he went to he moved to the UK um, with this idea of he was going to um further his music career when he got there or here um he started to do an awful lot of emotional blackmail and say he was going to kill himself and that he was going to die if I didn't come over there and and so I was putting huge pressure on my mum he was putting huge pressure on my mum and dad on, on my parents for to to send me to the UK and my mum had realized by the time it was at this point it's like the it was too late to do anything. She thought, if I don't send her, it will be worse for me than if she did send me. She thought, well, if I send her, and, and initially, I mean, you've got to remember, it wasn't like, yeah, go and move in with this guy and I will never see you again. The initial thought, the initial plan was I was to go to the UK for a month. Right. And then it got six weeks. And then it was I know, three months. And then it was just, and then it was just, I never went back. Right, it was sure. like, oh, I'll go back at Christmas. I'll go back next year. And then I just never went back. So so what my mum was thinking, she was in this place of, she thought, well, what if he did kill himself? What if he's, you know, he had was emotionally blackmailing her as much as he was me. And she was in this position of, well, whatever I do, it's going to be damaging. What's the least damaging? Mm. And what her belief system, you know, set up was that, that if I was in the UK, but she still had contact with me, that that would be better than just kind of shattering the relationship that we had at the time. So she was basically doing the best that she could with the situation, because by the time it got there, it was already almost too late, I guess. Yeah. And I think what you said there is that I, I so I'm, I'm schooled in NLP. And, and one of the things that we talk about is that everybody's doing the best they can with the resources they have. And one of their resources is their belief system, you know, their, yeah. their map of the world. And, um, and, and that this isn't a place to judge. Um, and, uh, but I'm, what I'm interested in is the story of what went through in your mind. And let's say the things that he's gone on to do one of my core beliefs, I call it a global belief is that life happens for you, not to you. And um, you, you said just before we went, uh, we, we went live was that you, you're still alive which means that you've you've still got work to do you know there's, there's still still stuff that you can you can be doing which is which is a really interesting way of, of seeing things so um like i said the, the, the purpose of this podcast is not to, to sort of bring the, the whole story but it's a very pivotal story in in your life for obvious reasons so five years of, of being under effectively house arrest so could you leave the house yeah yeah i could i was allowed to go for out for very specific purposes and and this is one of the myths that there is around um around and it not just um sort of pedophilia and uh trafficking because essentially in the technical definition of the sense i was trafficked and i there were some reasons why i didn't end up in um prostitution and there was some i was like actually because of the situation the way my mum had set it up i managed to avoid that um but when people are trafficked and i've done a lot of work with people who have been trafficked um, to help them recover. One of the things is this belief that, oh, you're locked in, you know, the whole, um, whenever we, people talk about, um, you know, um, paedophiles and child abusers, there's always this vision of, you know, kids being grabbed and thrown in the boots of cars and locked in basements. And the fact is, they don't need to do that. They don't need to physically lock anyone up because you're emotionally, mm -hmm. mentally so enslaved that they don't need to. They've got you. So it's a combination of emotional blackmail. It's a combination of psychological trickery. It's a combination of um, uh, they do a lot of um, 
So they, there's, there's actually a whole series of kind of abusive um, tr markers. So one is they make you responsible for their happiness. So then they're very fickle. Um, so you'll become hyper-focused on them. They also control the money and they do that by, so you end up having no support system. They isolate you. So, so um, people are, and this is also true in just domestic violence, you know, d domestic abuse situations. So they'll um, control your, your mindset, your money, your um your friends so they just kind of like even though i was allowed out if i ever let slip that i had spoken to anyone else he would just go into a rage mm. so i did speak to other people and i did have some school friends but it was very secretive i didn't take them home i didn't go and visit them it was all you know i really wasn't allowed didn't you know i mean this is pre-mobile phones but i wasn't allowed to phone any of them they didn't phone me so i never gave out my phone number and fundamentally, I was incredibly isolated. So with no friends, no family, because they normally they, they, you know, isolate you from your friends and family, keep you broke, take all your money. And they do a lot of things that are intentionally to erode your self-esteem. So with no self-confidence, no money, no family, no support system, they don't need to lock you up. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's just like, and in fact, Physical violence is is can be quite rare in these situations because they don't really need to hit you either. They don't need to. You so yeah. You've it. it I mean, what a dark art. Um, mm. In in terms of, of that respect, and the nearest that I can get to it, it's interesting you saying this. Um, I, I watched a TV program which no doubt you're familiar with that come out. Well, I watched it at the end of last year. I'm not sure when it came out. Um, called Missing. Um, I, that. I can't remember. If I watched it, that. Is it, is it missing? Maybe it wasn't called Missing. Um, but there, there's a I should have bought this. I'm only thinking about this now because I wasn't planning on, on talking about this. I was going to make a note about it. I'm sure it's called The Missing or Missing. Um, but some of the stuff that you, you mentioned um, is um, very, very well portrayed. What is, is been portrayed. Um, yeah, The Missing is what it's called, The Missing. And there's two series, um, one with a little boy that goes missing and, and one with a girl. But in series two is the one with a girl. And, and that's um, the, the one that sounds very similar to, to what you're saying here. And, 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 and the, uh, the series portrays it in a way where you've just said they're, they're not, okay, they were locking them up, but you can just see from some of the stuff that you mentioned where they, they portrayed that in the film. So let, let's, let's skip a little bit then. So five years in, how does that end? So uh, there was, a, uh, it was a, one of these crazy stories, and this is probably, um, this, uh, it's a little bit woo-woo, but so... He, on the rare occasions he did lock me in, he would lock me in the back room. And it was just like this, it was like the spare room and there was nothing in there, there was no furniture, nothing. And he, uh, so he'd put me in the back room and I probably answered back or questioned him or something, I don't know. And uh, it was becoming apparent, a lot of the relationship worked on I'm smarter than you. And as I was going, as I was going through my A-levels and then started my degree, it became apparent that actually he's not smarter than me. And I think I probably questioned something, anyway. There was the lock-in and I remember thinking and I was there and it was just like I was just so desperate and I realized I was really unhappy and I know that sounds like a crazy thing to say like surely you were unhappy and it's actually often people who are in these situations are in such a state of like this is it I'm trapped and they don't even allow themselves the the, the luxury of of admitting to themselves that they're unhappy so I went right into this this is awful I don't want to live like this and then I started to I don't know pray and it was like, someone must come, please, someone come, please send someone, send someone to get me out of this situation, send help, someone, please, someone must come. And then I, I, I swear it was if I heard them, this voice, and it was like this, you know, when somebody shouts out of a car window of a train window and you get the Doppler effect. Yeah. And yeah. It was, so it was like that. And I heard this kind of whooshing sound and I heard this, no one is coming. Now that sounds really negative. It's like, there was this moment of like, oh, okay, that's it, I'm stuck here. But then the next thing that happened, and this is where some things that sound disempowering are actually really empowering. Because at that moment, I thought, well, if no one's coming, I'll have to get myself out. And that's when I started to make plans. Now it did take me about a year and I had to, I set up savings accounts and squirreled money away and I got my parents on board, but kind of like 
even my, my mum was really smart in that she was like very, very softly. She knew that if she rushed it, that I wouldn't like I'd probably end up, you know, no, it's fine. It's fine. I'm really happy here and I'm staying. So, yeah. she, you know, very, very gently kind of. So and it was really hard to set up a, a different like because he had access to my bank account. So I had to set up another bank account and and all this stuff. So I managed to squirrel money away. And then I started to do some stuff. So I started to do some Tai Chi. I got a bike and I got myself physically fit. And it's like, I kind of like, I almost did without realizing it, everything you would need to build up internal strength, psychological strength, emotional strength, financial resilience, you know, like financial resourcefulness as in I've now got some money. And I remember um, I, I said to my mom and it was like the time I, the moment I said, I want to leave. I really want to leave. And the first words out of her mouth, and this is the piece that always makes me cry a bit. She'd like, there was no, I told you so. Oh, I knew this. I've been waiting for this. There, all she said was, what do you need? What do you need? And whenever anyone says to me, like, what can you do to help somebody get out of situations like that? And you just ask that one bloody question. What do you need? And that's, that's all it took. And I said, well, I need some deposit for a house. I need some, someone to help me get my stuff out of the flat. And she was like, okay, well, I can send you the money. You'll have to fit, you'll have to hire, you know, get someone with a, you know, get a taxi to, to yeah. help shift your stuff. I, I think what, what you've just said there, and it gives me goosebumps, right? And, I've, and this is probably the second or third time, third time I brought this up on this podcast is that um, there's a particular guy um, called Casper Craven. Who lovely guy. I've had him on the show. Phenomenal individuals. Casper, if you're listening to this, how you doing, my friend? And he asked that exact same question. You know, and, and, and so we were actually doing my TEDx talk, and he was speaking, and I was speaking, and we were chatting in the green room. And I don't know where he just said, "What do you need?" And I was just like, "Wow." Now he that that's something that I've learned since that he just does because he wants to help people. And how can? But at the time, there was something that I really did need, and I I, I was just so taken back and like emotionally like, "What? Wow, someone's." willing to, to help it and that's why when you said I, I i sometimes get a bit that sort of gets you a bit emotional i, I can i get that and I, I remember another time when a good friend of mine paul i referred to as uncle paul when i was in a bit of a tough space just said how are you will but not just hey mate how are you it was will how are you and i just cried i had to hang the phone up because it was i was in a, a bit of a tough time at the time so it's it's amazing what that 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 small gesture can can do so um incredible absolutely incredible and um so obviously then 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 getting back to to normality let's let's talk about that 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 period so still looking forward to the normal piece 20 years old <laughs> yeah so i was 20 years old then i'd started my degree yeah um and the uh so i was doing my engineering degree and i i think i'd probably i mean i've always loved science and it was my childhood dream to be a scientist you know white coat multicolored pens in the top pocket <laughs> and um have the white coat have the multicolored pens and uh and uh, i think i'd done it i had gone into science partly because like you don't need to deal with emotions you don't need to it's just like what's the answer it's a number it's a number and it's right or it's wrong and um, but it was really obvious for a while. It actually took me a while to realize that most people didn't live like this. So I started waking up and like going, oh, God, another day. And it was like, I've got to drag myself through today. And if I can just get through today, then I can go to bed again tonight. And then it will and then I'll, I'll have a rest from the day. And I didn't realize that most other people don't live like that. I just thought, well, it doesn't everyone live like this. And, you know, you put on your brave face and you just get through the day. And um, and after a while, I realized, you know what? This isn't normal. This isn't how people, this isn't how it should be. There's more to life than this. So I went on um, a bit of a, a bit of a quest to try and uh, resolve that. I also had, um, there was one thing that I loved to do. So I managed to drag myself through my degree got a decent degree I was working and didn't really much like my job and again it was like you know that dragging myself through the day and I was out I was out on a bike ride and cycling was one of the few things that really I just felt alive when I was cycling and I stood there in the front hall and I was about to get out on my bike and I had it was really cold night you know when those when you breathe and there's like the the frost or you know that the frost in the air cold November day I remember it and I had in one hand my woolly hat and I thought I'd really love to wear that because my ears are going to get so cold. And then I now put on the fancy, you know, the fancy aerodynamics of the air flows through the helmet, helmet. And I thought I better put my helmet on. So I put my helmet on out for this ride. And 
just about to smash my personal best on a particular 10 mile route, which I needed to do. I needed, I was in training for a particular, um, to get a particular result in a time trial because one of the women's Tour de France, two of the women's Tour de France teams were interested in me because I'm really good at, I'm probably not so much now, but I was really good at climbing, hill climbing. So um, coming up to this, uh, coming up this hill and it was at this clock tower, it was a roundabout with a clock tower on it. And I could see out of the corner of my eye, this car coming. I thought he must have seen me. And I kind of look, I was looking to the to the right, giving way at the roundabout. And there was this, oh, he hasn't seen me. And there was that split second decision, like, do I speed up or do I break? And I knew how fast I was going, I knew how fast he was going. I thought my best hope here is I speed up. So I got out of the, you know, um, you know, out of the saddle, stood up on the pedals, push, pull, push, pull, just for that much. He clipped my back wheel, got thrown high in the air, slammed down on the other side of the roundabout. And then the next thing, it's like this total, I, I'm out of my body. I'm looking down and my elbows belt and bent in a weird way. And I'm like, oh, that looks nasty. And there's this presence next to me saying, so what are we doing then? You uh, going, that, going back into that or are you coming with us? And it was literally, there was no, like, it was just, you know, what are you doing? You come with us or you start, you're going back. And obviously I did choose to come back. Was it a conscious choice? So do you remember like the same way that I would consciously make the decision to, to go into the fridge and, and get a, like if I wanted to make a decision now, was it a conscious choice or you just found yourself back? Uh, very much a conscious choice. Very much that I was, I, you can, and you know, I was kind of, I remember it was like having this conversation with this, you know, non-physical entity. And it's like, you know, so what are you doing? You're coming with us? And it's like, well, what happens if I come with you? And it's like, well, you don't go back. And I was like, you come with us and you know, that's it. So, and it was very much like, no, no, I'm, I'm going to go back. I'm going to go back. And they're like, you sure? You know, you can come with us. Sure, we can go back. Just, and it was very, it, I very clearly made it, made the decision to live. Mm. But what I, what I was less conscious of until a little bit later was that I'd also made the decision to get like, to, to make life work, to have a better life. It's like, I'm going to go back, but I'm not going to go back to how it was. I'm going to go back to what's possible. It was almost like it was kind of a reset for me. I was like, well, you know, you don't want more of the same, do you? And it's like, no, I really don't. I really don't. So I, I obviously came back and chose something very different. That's interesting then. So it, from what I'm hearing from you, it wasn't the, it wasn't get, escaping the five years of, of, of being sort of a, a virtual prisoner in a foreign country with a paedophile that, that was the pivotal moment. It was being knocked off your bike. In a weird way, yeah, yeah, but it was a bang on the head, so to speak. Yes, to yes, you know? yeah. I mean, I, I mean, I broke. Turned out, I'd broken most of the bones in the right hand side of my body, including the bone in my spine, my ribs, my collarbone, my jaw, my elbow. Was like literally. I, I mean, I'm not supposed to be able to put my my palm flat, and I'm rather proud, but I I can't lock it. So doing press, you know, when you do push ups and you lock it at the top. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's really difficult for me. <laughs> so um, yeah. But the thing is, I don't think, I think I was reckless in that moment. And I also know that um, there was something about that. Like I was given that point, that that decision point of like, well, do you really want more of the same? Do you really want more of the same? And if I hadn't had all that, you know, all that trauma and the depression and the, you know, all the peak was what was labeled now as PTSD, I wouldn't, you know, I don't. I don't know if it would have felt like the same decision. It wasn't just to live or die. It was to live. It was to not. It was like to live and really live. Yeah. To, to, are you going to survive or thrive? You know. Yes. That's, that's, that's kind of the the, the viewpoint. And um and, and and I think we've many people, even those listening to this, will, will will have had those moments. It may not have been the bike that knocked them off. It may have it, whatever it would have been. They would have had their proverbial accident you know um and often it is that some significant emotional event that gets people to change i do an exercise with people um and i, I call it the scrooge process so i get them to identify what what's the actions they've been doing that prevent that's cost them costing them and gonna cost them by keep doing those actions in their future and, and then sometimes that's enough to get people in tears because they're like i just don't want that and that that can be enough to, to make them change so you you had a very very profound moment you mentioned ptsd now people have um we've all experienced stuff you know so for you that that there's few people 
um, that, that would have had five years of being sort of kept a, a prisoner in a foreign country, but we've all had stuff that trigger us. Do you still get triggered by anything in relation to, like if you were to watch something on TV or in a film, does it ever come up for you in any way? Very, very rarely. Almost never. And the reason I say almost is, see, the, 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 way, I, the way I kind of think about healing and trauma is you can only heal, you can only release and deal with what you're conscious of. Yeah. And the point of a trigger is actually to enable you to say, to become conscious of something that you need to work on. So I don't ever see triggers as being a bad thing. They're just information. So you're going to say something. I, I, I wasn't, I, I, again, I, so I just want to, I'm mindful of, of sort of, we, we're using certain labels that maybe people won't be, what wouldn't necessarily be aware of, but how I define um, a trigger would be some sort of emotion. It could be ho- ho- positive and emotional, or it could be a negative emotion. But I, I refer to sort of what I call the rift symptoms. So stress, overwhelm, frustration, depression, anxiety, unfulfillment, anxiety, all, the, all those negative emotions. But I define those as just simply signals or a signal to get you thinking or acting differently. Is Do, do you agree? Is that what you, you think as well? I think, yeah, so fundamentally, yes, I've got a slightly different take on things. So I, first of all, I think there are emotions that you feel in the now as a result of something that's happening now. So if you are in a situation, emotions have a purpose and they are to guide us there to let us know when we're moving towards our goals or when we're, when we're not basically, yeah. that's the point it's of them. Feedback is feedback. It's feedback. And they're only, so it, good emotions, bad emotions. There's no, there's no bad emotions. There's no negative emotions, but what there is, is stuck emotions and I typically call that trauma just for one of a better word and I have this really um I don't know a slight and unusual take on how emotions work so I have this so here's my, my my theory I believe that we are infinite beings and that we have an infinite number of neurological connections in our in our body that's not an uncommon belief system and the idea is that we that when we're working like when it's all working optimally information to just flow through and and it and it will flow and we might experience positive and negative but we'll just feel that as like it's just information and we won't attach any labels to it it's just like oh yeah that's telling me i'm working that's that's working or that's not working you know it's like when you're you know play that game when you're in it when you're a kid and somebody hides something in a room and you're walking around looking they say warmer colder like that's all they are yeah, there's yeah, no yeah. they're not good or bad they're just that's, that's a colder. great way of putting it. i've never heard that before we all remember that game that we played <laughs> yeah, kid, yeah. a great way of explaining it yeah and that's all they are so when people go i just want to feel happy all the time and it's like well, actually, no, what you want to do is you want to have really useful working emotions that tell you when you're warmer, colder. Yeah, yeah. The problem is when we feel, even when we're getting what we want and, and we're actually getting what we want and it's working, we still feel bad. Or we try and suppress any bad feelings and pretend it's all working when it's clearly not. Mm. So we kind of do false, false positives. So my theory is that what happens is that... so information energy prana chi use whatever word you like the idea is it should flow freely throughout your being but what happens is in the past you have some if you have some kind of event it can create a block or a restriction or a break in your neurology and here's what i my take on it is that what happens is energy that so then you've got this resistance in your neurology energy tries to flow And you'll have an experience where energy will try and flow, but it will hit the resistance. And then what happens is on one side of that resistance, energy will build up. And on the other side, you'll get what you'll experience as, you know, it's like a depletion. And and those can be labeled all sorts of things. And, you know, anger, sadness, fear, hurt, guilt, classic ones. And what so there's two ways that healing that um, can work. So one is. What you do is you do some kind of energy work. So there's lots of Reiki, um, uh, EFT, emo trance, that kind of thing. And what you do is you take the, the level that's high and the level that's low and you build this up and you deplete that. So they're in, they're balanced. Yeah. The problem is the resistance is still there. So you feel great. I'm healed. Then a week later, you need to come back for the healing session again because the resistance is still there. 
Then the other way that it's approached is by understanding what caused the block. And you may even by getting the learnings and doing NLP and things like that. And, you know, I'm a trainer of NLP is you, you may actually remove the block, but the energy imbalance is still there. So what I've done is I created a form of energy here, a form of healing, a form of um, transformation, and it's called conscious emotional transformation. And what it does is pretty much what it says on the tin is wherever you are conscious of where there's a resistance and you know that because you feel emotion now because of an event from the past. Yeah. And, and that's what I label as trauma, that, that it's created that resistance in your neurology. And what SET does is it removes the resistance, heals those connections, and it floods the system with infinite energy, really high level of energy, so that all the, rebalance, the imbalances are restored. So it's like a reset. I, I absolutely love this. And, and the reason being is that I, I often talk about the, one of my frustrations with the work that I do is, is so in, in the industry that we're in, is a lot of people treat symptoms, right? And the problem is if you keep treating the symptom, the cause is still there, which was that first example that you gave is that, right, well, you go and have your Reiki or whatever, and then uh, and then if, if you've not dealt with the cause, it's still going to come back, right? Yeah. Whereas what you're talking about is treating the cause so that the symptoms go and, and doing, I, I love that very simple way of, uh, of, of understanding that. And I, it makes perfect sense to me. And I'm sure it will do to, to many, many listeners here. So what, what the, the, one of the, the things that I'm really interested in then, so that that's incorporating the, the, what I would call the scientific element of it. So it's something that you can replicate and do over and over again. It's not just you, you did this weird thing and something crazy just happened once and every now and then it happens. Like this is a science you can replicate this over and over and over. And I know you've had about 30,000 spiritual practitioners train with you in this, in this modality on elements of it. Right. So this yep. is something that you've, you've got to, so if people right now are being, and we, we all are, I believe have stuff from the past that, that triggers and they want to overcome that. Are there any specific steps that they can do without doing this full method that uh, could, could be some quick wins around being? Yeah. So one of the things, well, you can actually, what I, what I do is I'm, I'm actually, I can gift anyone the, the full process. It's an online home study version. So if anyone wants that, is that okay if I share that a link? Absolutely. Yeah, I'll yeah, yeah. Get you that link and it's completely free. And uh, you, so anyone can experience it for themselves. So you, you don't get oh, a, that's incredible. Thank you. And I, I, I set this out into the world um, completely free. The only thing I ask is that you pass it on to someone else as well. Love it. <laughs> well, what would I'll do? I'll say it now rather than try and remember at the end. I'll put the link to it in the show notes. So if you're listening Perfect. right now and you want to get access to it, it's very, very kind of you. Thank you very much. We'll, uh, we'll pop it in the show notes. So people can yeah. Get it. Yeah, I mean, and and just to give yourself some some things is uh, to some quick wins right now is to first of all, um, if at all possible, uh, so one of the most powerful phrases that I think you can say is rather than saying that's good or that's bad or I feel good or I feel bad or this situation is, you just come to a place or you come to everything from a place of curiosity. Mm. And this moves you out of judgment because one of the things that creates that restriction is this judgment. I mean, there's a whole, there's a, and I explain it in my book, Total Trauma Recovery, about how trauma gets installed. And it gets installed because we, the, we have an experience, we want to respond to it, we don't know how to respond to it, or the information coming in is too fast for us to, to understand what's going on. So we make inappropriate connections that don't really make sense. And that's basically how limiting beliefs get installed. And... Um, and so the, the and so the thing the first thing to do is to just remove any judgment and you just say this one phrase which is how interesting <laughs> how interesting uh, you, uh, I, I love this i'm so glad we're having this conversation because we, we don't really know each other well we've connected <laughs> by our, um, uh, a peer group that we're part of and what one of the things that i would I'm, I'm so specific and pedantic with language, you know, and I, I won't say to people, well done, it always be like great effort and, 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 and do my best to not talk about good and bad, because again, good and bad is subjective. It's all on one spectrum, right? Everything's on a spectrum. And often, if someone says something to me that I don't agree with, I will say, and, and sometimes when I do agree with it as well, is that that's the exact word I'll use. That's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that's, that's so, in, uh, so interesting to say that, but it's, um, yeah, it's f phenomenal. So 
I, I, I absolutely love this. Um, what, what I, I would like to do, because we, we started talking about some of the, the elements of how your work works and, and what you do, but when was that transition from being a scientist? I mean, you've got a, um, a PhD in mathematical modeling and aero uh, acoustics. I mean, yeah, that's, that's hard sums about noisy fans. We keep it simple. <laughs> you're, you're a smart lady, that's for sure. Um, and, and rightly so, you've, you, you're obviously a um, Dr. Turner. But the, in, in terms of um, in, in, in terms of making that transition of going, do you know what? I'm not going to work in, in this and I'm, I'm going to move into the world of, of, of working in the spiritual realm, let's say, um, of being a people helper. How did that happen for you? Yeah, so probably not unlike a lot of people when I was on my own journey to find my own solutions, I tried everything. So I studied in lots of stuff. I studied in shamanic healing and NLP and I, you know, I experienced it for myself and trained in it. And then I started to realize that I could help people and that I really wanted to. And it, it kind of grew slowly. And for a long time, I was actually, I was actually, it was almost like I was a split personality. And what's really interesting in, in the world of academia, um, you actually, particularly married women, we really struggle because when you've, when you've ever you've published a paper or your academic um, reputation, it's obviously attached to your, your, your surname. And so lots and lots of women, um, work under their maiden name for so for a long time I was two people and I was Dr Austin my maiden name by day academic researcher and senior lecturer in automotive engineering and then by night I was Mrs Turner the shamanic healer and, <laughs> and it was a there was the, always the this ego yes <laughs> it was like I was these two people and it just it just kind of happened that I was getting more joy from doing my you know, doing my coaching and healing work than I was from my research. And I got myself stuck into a, in a particular job at work, as happens in any career, that I wasn't particularly enjoying that bit of that branch of research. So I was looking for something else. And then I just thought, you know what, I'm just going to give it a go. And uh, 17 years later, I'm still giving it a go. <laughs> I, I think it's incredible. And, and there's, there's there's quite a few people now, similar to yourself, that, that trained um uh, to, to a high level and sort of PhDs take someone like Deepak Chopra as well, sort of training Western medicine that then has moved more to the realms of understanding spiritual work, but there's not sort of just one modality. It's pulling everything in together and, and, and making it work for you. But I love how the, the sort of kind of simplistic way that you, um, that, that you bring it into um, in, in terms of um, the, the mission now, the mission that you're on and the, the work that you do, you wake up every day and ask you, right, how can I create more joy today? How can we have fun? And, and you're, you're a great personality and I'm really enjoying this conversation. Um, wh where, does, where does that go um, for, for you now in terms of what's, what's next? What, 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 what's the, the, the mission? Oh, so my, what I would love to do is I'd love to see conscious emotional transformation used by everyone all the time. That's one of the reasons I've gifted the home study pack and the only, you know, just it's just there online, um, work through it yourself and get as many people trained in this as possible. So that, because I believe that pretty much all the problems, if I don't really like the word problem, but the challenges of the world from climate change to we've got some interesting leadership situations going on, won't judge them as, but they, but they are interesting leadership situations. And, um, I think that everything that is suboptimal is be, is uh, comes about because people make decisions from a place of pain. How can I avoid my own pain? How can I avoid my own shame? So this is why you get leaders who aren't necessarily working for the highest good of all. They're working for their own interest or to protect themselves in some way. They're, they're trying to protect their own emotional damage. And if we work from a place of where everyone can release their pain, where nobody is in judgment of somebody who's in pain, because I think that's one of the, you know, there's, we, you know, the, the and I, I'm really encouraged at the moment by the whole movement of mental health issues that mm. the shame and stigma around mental health, because that's, you know, it's like, if somebody has, you know, a like, the, I don't believe there's anyone who doesn't have some level of trauma you know, some level. And it's not that you've had a horrible thing happen to you. It's that something's happened to you and you haven't managed to 
you know, that somehow caused a disturbance in your in your neurology. And, you know, I don't think there's anyone who doesn't have that to some extent. And then if we judge people essentially for being human, which is, you know, you know, for, for being human because, oh, they've got problems, then then it becomes shameful. And then we have this layer on layer on layer of trying to hide it. And that's where we end up in a right old mess where people make decisions where they just trying to like, what can I get? What can I get with and give the least? And if yeah. we could flip that, sorry, you were going to say something. I, I, I was on, on that thing around the judgment thing. I think I don't know what your opinion is of this, but that the people, in my opinion, that are the most fearful of being judged are the ones that judge the most. Absolutely. And when you flip that and go, right, well, let's let's look at it from a different view. Let's let's rather than judging them, i.e. in a, a, a let, let's say a pessimistic way, let's flip the focus because where focus goes, energy flows and, and just look at what's the positive. What is it that they're trying to do? What is the positive in their intent? Again, a presupposition of NLP, which you know is every action has a positive intention. All right. I mean, you might not perceive it um, positive in your map of the world, but in their map of the world, let's look at it from their perspective and have a level of empathy and compassion and look at it from their point of view and, and see that. And that's how we can then start judging people less, which in which in, in, in by doing that, we start to judge ourselves. Less. That's, that's kind of what I've experienced personally. And, um, and, and sort of a, a lot of the, the, the research and studying that I've done has, has kind of led to, do you have a similar opinion on that? Absolutely. And, and, you know, that one of the things I've noticed in the spiritual community at the moment, it's got to this place where it's almost it's almost become sort of toxically positive and that, you know, that the spiritual community is now is, you know, there's a lot of elements of it and aspects of it that are quite judgmental. And um, there's there's actually a really ancient Buddhist um, breathing technique that has become distorted. So you probably heard the idea, you know, just, you know, taking some deep breaths and you breathe in the positive and you breathe out the negative. That actually got distorted because the original, one of the original Buddhist teachings was, you breathe in the negative, you transmute it and you breathe out the positive. Alchemy, I mean, right? absolutely, absolutely. And you think about, you know, you think about, well, so if the whole world is going around breathing in the positive breathing out the negative what does that create for the world it creates a world where like everyone's just trying to you know get rid of their negative rather than transmute it so oh. that and it's yeah. like if we want for our enemies what they want for themselves which is what everyone wants which is what everyone wants which is to be loved to feel acknowledged to feel appreciated you know the standard thing to to feel worthy to, to be themselves, to feel that, to recognize that, remember, remind themselves that they are the, an aspect of the divine. If we want that for everyone, like if everyone wants that, not just for themselves, but for everyone, including their enemies, then that's where true compassion and true empathy comes. That's, that's when we can get to that place. But I think if we work on ourselves first and heal our own pain, so we're not trying to hide, oh, I'm not perfect. And it's like, I'll gladly say to anyone, I'm really not perfect. Mm. I annoy my husband a lot. And he says, for God's sake, go and do some exercise because you're annoying me. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, look, I, I think that's absolutely bang on. And, and the, the, the incredible film, it always moves me to tears, is The Green Mile. And, and and he does that exactly doesn't he you know i forget he the does. guy's name in the film and and absorbing that in sucks it in and, and is able to sort of um to to, to do the, the alchemy process and if if each day we could all be a little bit kinder then uh yeah it's it's good. And, and that's when i think what what has been some of the uh the the uh, out of any challenge um there will be support you know and um, with what's gone on this last year with the whole COVID situation, the Black Lives Matters thing, it is making people become more aware. And, and yeah, some people are, are pushing themselves to extremes. And um, but but for a lot of us, we can we can see the opportunity there and and be mindful of that when we're um, when we're we're looking at um, or, or found finding ourselves judging others because um, it's ultimately a, a reflection, right? In some way or another, like we said, as a signal to to look at. To, to doing differently yeah and in that also it's like if you find yourself judging others don't judge yourself even harshly for even you know more harshly for judging others it's like oh how interesting there i was judging so how do we we, we if we if people are doing something right that that is 
triggering us and is causing an annoyance um and it's happening now we could turn around and go, well look, okay i'm going to see how it's serving them and it's going to be good and and that's okay but then it keeps happening what do people do in that situation i think this is where we keep it really really simple and uh we have this great saying i grew up in australia we have this great saying and it's just and it goes like this cut it out <laughs> Mm. It's just, I think, I think we overcomplicate it. And I think there's, you know, in NLP, there's the, and a lot of spiritual um, belief systems, there's this idea that we are the creator of our own, you know, our own universe, our own reality. And it's like, well, we might be, and we might not, mm. but what we can do is we can be the creator. We can uh, choose how we experience something. If somebody's behaving in a way that is not okay with you, tell them, and ask them what you want to do differently. If it's if they say like, well, how come my whatever it is, you know, this normal thing is annoying you so much, then maybe look at yourself. But it is okay. It's apps. This is one of the things I've noticed in the spiritual community. It's like suddenly it's not okay to have boundaries. It's like if you say, look, I'm not okay with you doing that. It's like oh, is this triggering you? You've obviously not healed. You're not evolved enough or spiritual enough. And it's like, yeah. Or you could just be a bit of an asshole. <laughs> uh, do you know? It's, it's so so it, 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 I think it's fantastic hearing someone say that. That's from your world. Say from your world, as if we're not in the same world. But from my but, planet, we but, speak like this. <laughs> <laughs> but, but from from your that's in a position which you are which is a, a spiritual thought leader and someone to just say no it's okay we don't you don't have to stay in that environment really is what we're saying is it's not you take yourself out of the environment the whole cut it out thing um and and, and have those boundaries because that's important that in itself is a form of self-care self-appreciation your self-esteem is going to become come from that some having those and uh and yeah, look, if, if, if you don't like something, change it. If you can't change it, change the way you think about it. Um, and if you can't change the way you think about it, then go, go back and change it again. It's, it's one, of those, go, one, one of those things. So um, uh, yeah, I mean, f phenomenal. Um, I, I've got to ask, um, so sort of coming back to the, uh, the, the, the sort of original situation for you, which from, from the age of 12 and 15, those five years, forgiveness. Oh, yeah. So I, w I view it like this. So first of all, I don't believe that we can forgive if you are still in the situation and someone is still behaving like that. If somebody is still doing something to like, not to you, but like, for you, should we say that, that you, somebody is still behaving in a way that you're not okay with, you either need to, they ask them to change it and they do or if they don't, you need to leave. So like, that's a kind of a given. But when it comes to forgiveness for somebody doing something, I, if you ask the question, what are you really forgiving? What's, what causes you to think or believe you need that there's anything to forgive? And the only thing I can ever think of is that they damaged you in some way. Mm. And if you come from this perspective that and, you know, it's just, I'll just say, it's just a suggested way of thinking about it. So if we work from the idea that we're all an aspect of the divine, we're all divine. If I am in the, if I experience myself as divine, as divinity, what, and divinity is infinite, what can damage or lessen something that's infinite? Mm. So the only reason that I need, that there's a need for forgiveness is because I'm either allowing someone to do something to me that I'm not, you know, behave in a way that I'm not okay with. I'm an, and I'm allowing that, in which case I need to not allow it or leave. So there's no need for forgiveness. Or I'm thinking that they've damaged me in some way. Mm. And 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 that the only way I could think that is that I've forgotten that I'm divine. And I that's a, a wonderful way of, of of seeing things to flip that perspective. Um, or, or to put the shoe on the other foot, maybe should I say, is the forgiveness of self. So if mm. people have got, if people are holding on to a lot of shame and guilt, then does the same apply? I, yes, I believe so. And, you know, so here's a metaphor that I use to, um, to explain forgiveness and forgiveness of self. So now, I don't know if this is true, but this is just how I think about it. Let's just imagine that like before we incarnated, we were kind of like, you know, floating around as these, you know, non-physical ethereal souls or whatever. And we say, hey, let's play a game. And it's like, let's go play the virtual reality game. Yeah. 
And um, I know I want to have the experience of, I don't know, like being in an abusive relationship. Who, who wants to play with me? It's like, I'll play. I'll be the abuser. Okay, let's get up. Boom. There you are. You're in your bodies and you're having it, but you've forgotten that you're, you're, that you're source. So there you are in that experience. And so when it comes to forgiveness, it's like, well, if you perceive yourself as having been damaged, then yeah, heal up that damage. And that's, you know, one of the, you know, NLP has got some great techniques as, you know, and, and set conscious emotional transformation, really powerful technique as well. So heal that up. That's where you can release the guilt and the shame. Mm-hmm. And then you almost like, you almost want to fi- um, forgive yourself for having that other person for needing that other person to have to play that ugly role in your life. Mm. So like, I, I have no idea if this is true or not. Like I say, it's just like one of the great things about engineers is we just like models. Mm. Nothing I say is the truth, but neither is it a lie. It's just a model. And, you know, so my PhD mathematical modeling. So, um, so this, this model of, um, you know, this idea that we're just, playing this game that we're just playing this game that we've just kind of incarnated and we're just going to interact in this way and that you know nobody could um there's nothing that anyone could do that could harm me intrinsically and that if i've chosen to um have this experience of being abused then i must have done it because i wanted that experience and i'm not like and by the way i'm a, i'm really i really dislike that kind of the spiritual take on it like when you're talking to someone who's abused you never ever say to them oh well, you must have created that like let them come to that conclusion and help them to get there but that's never for anyone else to say but i t- i completely believe that i chose it and i chose it so that i could live this mission and do this work so that we can create you know with the likes of you and i and all the other people doing this work that we can all support each other to make a massive difference in the planet, you know, on the planet. Mm -hmm. And if I had to have a, you know, a bit of a weird teenagehood, that's, that's a small price. Yeah. Incredible. Um, I I could literally talk to you all day about this stuff, Lisa, but I appreciate we've, uh, we've, we've got um, things to be getting on with, but in, in terms of, your, your books, I just want to talk about it. So you've got a, a number of books. Um, so you've got, I love the pedophile, the light worker's journey, spiritual guide to riches. Um, no, the, the no one guide book, discover your spiritual leader power center. So that's the five that you've already got out that are out right now, but you've got two other books coming out. Yes. So I'm currently writing uh, Total Trauma Recovery, which is the explanation of how trauma happens and how you can heal it. And it's really how how set conscious emotional transformation works. And then I have another book, which I'm also writing, um, which is called Our Spiritual Tipping Point. And it describes a model of evolution of the of our species of society. And I came up with this model oh, about 10 years ago, and I've been working with it and using it. And it's a great tool for growth and personal development and group development. And it pretty much predicted, didn't predict the pandemic exactly, but it predicted a global shift, including that there'd be lots of conspiracy theories, there'd be lots of victim thinking, and that this is actually part of this process where when we've come through this, will be at, the, the, I think we're heading to a time of, after a little bit more turbulence, a little bit more, we're gonna enter a time of probably one of the most peaceful and stable times of our entire, like uh, our species history, where we, re- there, you know, where it is, re- tr- it really is possible to have peace on earth. I really believe that with this, and that, and that model predicts that, and it's, that's called our spiritual tipping point. Incredible. And the um, and, and when will people be able to get access to that? That will be out where we now beginning of uh, so that's going to be probably by the end of this year. There's a okay, little... so by the end of so people that will be listening to this in, in in years after it's coming out. So it's originally coming out at the end of 2021, um, and uh, and so if you listen to this after that, then you'll be able to get access to it and head to Amazon, I'm assuming, or uh, to to your website, and people will be able to get access to that. Um, 
Lisa, I've absolutely loved today's conversation. Thank you so much. Um, just a reminder for people, if you want to go and um, get access to the resource that Lisa mentioned, then head to the uh, the show notes and you can get access to that somewhere. If people have been listening to this and going, I need to meet this woman, I need to, to, to engage with her, follow her, connect with her, where can people find you? So you can go to my website, which is psychademy.co.uk. So that's uh, we'll pop it in the show notes head over to my to um the website or you can just hit me up on social media so just search for dr lisa turner psychademy dr lisa turner set c-e-t you probably find me on uh, various social media just hit me up connect with me and and we can chat love it thank you so much like i say this has been a, a wonderful conversation and i'm sure we'll have you back as a, another guest talking about this in part two and, and going into more depth very soon it'll be great fun to do that um so yeah really appreciate having you on the show Thank you so much. My pleasure. As so you've been listening, please head to the uh, the review section. Please review this. Give us a five-star review. Lisa's done a fantastic job. Leave a comment. And also, if you are interested, come and join our Facebook group, free Facebook group, the Make It Happen community. It'd be great to connect with you there as well. Um, until next time, make it happen. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Make It Happen with Will Polston podcast. Make sure you join Will's free Facebook group, the Make It Happen community. Please support the show by subscribing on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, SoundCloud, or Google Play. Share this episode with at least one friend you think would benefit from it and give Will a five-star review wherever you download your podcasts. Until next time, make it happen.